So I'm going to go ahead and, and call the roll for today. Uh, Jason Abadili. Is Jason here? Okay. Uh, Jeff Davis. I am here. Thank you. Kim Houck. Hi, guys. Kristen Henry. Good afternoon. Deborah Hoffine. Hi, all. Debbie Jenkins. I'm here. Willie Jones. Good afternoon. Kim Kelly. Present. Teresa Cobelt. I'm here. Pete Moore. I am also here. Ivo Mirnick. Here. Uh, Janet Stefan. Good afternoon. Bethany Toledo. I'm here. Gary Tonks. Gary let me know that he was going to um, potentially be able to join us by phone, but he wasn't sure. So he might pop on later. Um, Nate Turner. Present. Uh, Jason let me know that he unfortunately was not going to be able to make today's meeting. Uh, Renee Wood. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Renee. Welcome. Well, welcome, everyone. Our agenda for the day is um, some opening remarks by Director Davis. Then we're going to get an update on some of the findings or report that's coming out of the hotspot meetings that we've talked about previously. We're then going to look at um, a chart of all our proposals to date and check on the status of all of those, see if we need to make any adjustments or changes. Today's meeting is a, a one hour meeting, so we'll go ahead and get going. So let me throw it um, to the director. Jackie, thank you so very much. And to it is nice to see all of you. I think we have some new faces, people on the phone, so we certainly appreciate you joining us. <clears throat> so I'll start off a little bit. I will add on in addition to just the welcome. I'll talk about a couple of things. One is I'll start with technology. Technology is transformational in a system like ours. We have dabbled in it over the years. Admittedly, even in Ohio, we uh, have probably been more successful in its application than virtually every other state to this point, but it is, it still is on the periphery. And in a moment like this, and with all the demographic studies and everything out there, we know that we have to do something fundamentally different and with a little bit more aggression than we have to this point. So we know that technology provides safety and increases independence in the different ways in which we're using it. Obviously, technology is increasing, expanding in ways that I, I probably couldn't describe. So we're learning more all the time in how we do that. And so we collectively need to move the needle and set the stage for the future in the use of technology and how we do it across the board in our systems and when i say technology i'm not of course just talking about remote supports i'm talking about assistive technology and every other way that we can conceive of it as we learn and a number of our people that we support today and those that we support in the future will benefit from an increased and expanded and and more experiential use of technology we know this and in some cases that can decrease the dependence on staff and other cases it can allow providers to use their staff more efficiently and smarter. And we know this too. So there are multiple pieces to this puzzle of how we sort of now structurally expand the use of technology, how we learn about it. And so we'll start with a technology first rule that is uh, in the beginning stages of dissemination to look at, so for review and how we do that. But basically it says wherever we are, we're gonna think about technology first in the variety of ways that we know it today and as we'll know it tomorrow. We will then also put behind that a number of other things. One, we have our vendors today that work with us and part of that is that coordination of capacity. So if we have increased use and increased need, even increased desire for consultation that we'll have a coordinated response among our vendors to do it with some urgency. Part of that is just a simple tool that we'll call rapid response, which is a portal. So if I am a provider in need now, 
and I need someone to be out tomorrow, we'll be able to ask that and vendors will respond. If we have interest, we'll be on the part of county boards. We will ask the vendors will respond accordingly and be there with you and bring that expertise. The on-site on-call application we know, uh, you know, has been sort of, I gather, stuck for a bit. So that is an online application that helps us really get it on-site on-call. That's particular, of course, to where we may not need staff overnight. So both of those are IT uh, efforts. I am my finger, I am, I have faith and my fingers are crossed at the same time that our on-site on-call application that we will have a demo of that yet this week and i hope that with that we are close to getting that out for people to use the rapid response portal i hope uh, we will have a demo next week so we will be able to get that up with our vendors and move forward in that order and then uh obviously with our arpa monies because we want to put resource behind this and i do hope i say this too with a hope that the administration will have uh, something to share next week around the home and community-based ARPA efforts. Uh, but within that, in addition to provider relief, we have a request for uh, technology monies to help shore that, put that where it is needed. We have another sort of batch of ARPA monies that I think ultimately will focus on housing across all of its aspects across the multiple systems and we hope to have a healthy um, investment through those dollars into uh, creating more and more smart homes across the state of Ohio and how we do that. And of course, we have some providers across the state. Some are have been, you know, have devoted their mission and vision to the use of technology and and really are quite successfully out there already and figuring out how to do it. So how we can replicate that, we certainly will. So it is a it is a broad based effort in recognition that is systemic in its change and its application where it is appropriate, but arguably it is appropriate in many more settings. Technology is appropriate in many more settings than we think it is today. And with that transformation, we begin to set and reset our system to understanding both the environment that we're in that that looks to be with us for a while, but also taking advantage of the, you know, the remarkable kinds of things that are being created done and all these things day after day after day so uh, that's a piece of that puzzle I'll I'll move on from the technology piece but you can expect to see all of these things in short order including the technology first rule so that we can get that through its process the second is we had a request uh, from providers uh, to to really nudge our system forward particularly through our planning process on the ground to be to create crisis plans to sit with the teams and providers set up crisis plans for the individuals they support in situations where because you cannot predict when the staffing crisis will hit and necessarily always where it hits so instead of having to scramble and figure out what a default is and what other kinds of movement can happen let's planfully prepare for that now, moving forward, it is laborious in the planning process. I think we all fully understand that, but the back end is more freedom for, for providers to make moves when it is needed without some extended approval process or whatever the challenges are with doing that, that we know what we're going to do. We know where the different sets of expectations are, families, whatever it might be, where individuals can move on a temporary basis based on the severity of the challenge at the moment. And so what we'll do is sort of say, hey, system, this is exactly what we need to do now. This is how we can do it. We're seeing it done with certain providers in certain counties. So we have some models that are, that are working. It's always an adaptation, but it is again, a nudge or a push or a requirement, whatever we wish to use to say, we need to get this. This is where the planning matters and this is what we're gonna do. So we should see that in short order from us, both in writing, and we'll put some, I think, some visuals around that and some examples of how that can be done. So without a graceful break, I'll move on. We have had some requests around our compliance. Obviously, and I'm talking about provider compliance here, and so there is a desire, and I think what we've learned is that actually the virtual compliance 
in some respects has, has taken more time and effort, particularly on the part of the provider than actually being on site. Our on-site provider compliance reviews will begin in November, so we will be back to live. Now, if somebody wants a virtual, we're not gonna, that's fine, but our, we plan for live visits in July. I think uh, I'm gonna say this out loud, and you know, if we have to go back and change the recording to omit it, that will be fine, but you know, I think there are probably some ways that we can do, you know, abbreviated reviews there's some things that we can focus on perhaps that are more important than everything we're not trying to be invasive but the rash and this is what i believe so i'm saying this to you that it has been 18 months in large measure that we've had any eyes on the ground and i don't want to go three years without eyes on the ground so we'll try and find something in the middle that works for you understanding of course the severity of the situation and how time consuming these all can be i get it we do want to see, we want to be there, but we don't want to be overly intrusive. So I'll bet we can find that middle ground and make it work. So that's where I am. You can gracefully cut me off if you wish now, and uh, we'll move on to your agenda. Great, great. Any, any questions, questions on any of that before we move on? Yeah. Then let's go um, to Pete. I think Willie might be involved in presenting this as well. The two of you are going to share where you're at with quantifying and bringing recommendations from the hotspot visits. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, I hope. I'm a Zoom guy, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> So thanks, thanks for this opportunity. We did um, um, also work with Steve Beha, Stacy Collins, and Ann Wisent from the department on this effort. So um, I'll ask them to go ahead and uh, chime in wherever they would like. And uh, we'd like this to be also conversational. Uh, Jackie, can you see my screen? Yeah. Art? Okay. Yeah. You're the only one I can see right now, so I'm going to rely on you. Um, so this is a... a pretty high level summary of of the visits we're still working on um uh, on on some more detailed thoughts but just want to make sure we're we're providing an update um just a little bit of history i don't know what month it was at this point it was pretty early on in the workforce crisis task force um uh, uh process that we talked about maybe we should identify some hot spots across the state Hotspot being a place where the staffing crisis seems to be hitting the, the hardest. And um, uh, partnering with the department, every, everybody on the task force, we came up with a, a survey for providers, county boards, families, and people receiving services, and, and came up with uh, some decent data on, on uh, what was going on out there. Uh, I say decent not to demean the data, but, you know, it's, it's always hard to get all what you need from some of these. But in the end, I do think we were able to identify where some, uh, where there were some problems. And our initial analysis where there was uh, about 27 counties that were considered red or, or hotspot counties. And um, uh, so the next step in that was uh, after we identified those counties and the feedback we received from providers and and in county boards was, you know, if we're, if we're going to identify these areas, why don't you come see us and talk to us? And and that's what the hotspot visits were all about. So that's where we're at now. We we did our visits, and I'll I'll go through and hit some of the highlights. Um. So the purpose of these, and I'll, I know we have people on the phone, so forgive me for I'll read some of these off. Uh, I just want to make sure everybody uh, is able to walk away with what we're presenting here. Uh, the first thing is take a pulse of the reality of the DSP shortage, identify fears and concerns. And we, when we did this, we met with uh, county boards, providers, and uh, people receiving services and their families. Um, we want to identify some themes across the state. What are are there common characteristics that people have during this time? Um, identify some positive practices and that are working. One thing we saw where partnership is really strong 
um, things go a little better. At least you have that support. If nothing else, uh, we want to provide feedback to the to the uh, task force uh, like we're doing today and start to inform some future planning. Um, and the last one is identify possible uses for any emergency relief funds such as the ARPA funds. Any questions on the purpose? Next, we had uh, our process. We, we uh, the team, as I mentioned earlier, me, Willie, Steve, Stacy, and Ann, um, and we had a couple mixed in where others couldn't make it. Um, the team visited two counties per day with three hours allocated per visit. Uh, we spent an hour at each, uh, uh, each with people receiving services, families, and providers, and county boards. Um, the we asked about the fears and concerns. Uh, if we could fix everything, what would it look like? Kind of a magic wand question, uh, and, and how how can we solve this? And we visited Seneca and Marion, Perry and Licking, Mahoning and Portage, and Warren and Montgomery. We tried to get a, a sense of uh, larger counties versus smaller counties, and tried to hit spots uh, in different regions of the state to see if there were any different or or themes or the same themes. Any, pro any questions about process? So, I mean, uh, you know, I'm going to go over summary or slash themes of the visits. Uh, I mean, you guys are all fully entrenched in these discussions. These are not these are not um, maybe necessarily going to be groundbreaking to you, but. Um, it was definitely a for me personally, and I, I let the other folks speak. Uh, it was a, a, a very uh, moving experience. Um, you know, we all like to get out and see people and talk to them, but this it really highlighted how challenging things are. And, you know, I want to say this is, you know, we identified 27 counties. I mean, just this week, the stories this week alone of what's happening is is just continue to motivate, uh, should motivate us to really take these things on. But so obviously the DSP crisis is real and it's growing exponentially as 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 we even sit here and speak. Um, the fears of providers and families are are real and and heard some very moving stories from from uh, and heartbreaking stories from some of the families and and people receiving services. A big real fears out there. Family caregivers are struggling and in, in desperate need of supports. But even the people who are you know. Uh, independently supporting their own loved ones, uh, they're even suffering and, and can't get a break. And there were some very moving stories about that. Mental health needs of the people receiving services, their family caregivers, and are increasing doing, due to this crisis. Uh, um, the the collaboration, and this is what we heard from our visits. They're they're urging us to continue to work together and and come up with with. Uh, viable and real solutions as soon as we can and you know we have things that we've talked about this is nothing new to any of us but we have to continue to work uh, immediately to address issues of trust um uh there's urgency for uh, simplification of isps and that it gets to that crisis plan that the director just mentioned documentation billing service model all the things that that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis can we take a fresh look at it and this is again urged from from many of the people, county boards and providers, especially. Um, uh, some of uh, the summary and themes continued uh, collaboration partnership at all system levels is urgently needed. And as I said before, in those different counties where there's good partnerships, uh, strong partnerships, that uh, they're able to support each other and come up with some very creative things. And I think. Again, back to those individual crisis plans that the director mentioned, that was born out of that uh, local partnership. Um, the system must continue to explore ways reform and and uh, for long term sustainability. Um, so this shortage is is creating a um, another crisis, which is the physical and mental health on not only family, the people receiving services. It's all staff involved uh, in this in this situation. Um, and, you know, it's no secret either that, you know, we have to take some bold steps and 
and look at some creative ways to uh, address the DSP wage uh, and, and how we can sustain that long term. Any questions on summary or themes? I already went over these. We they're kind of a repeat of some of the things we've said. So I broke this down. Um, we were we we took a lot of notes and we talked to a lot of different people. So I wanted to break it down per kind of group that we interacted with. Um, the the first one is uh, the person receiving services, um, and these are just uh, some snippets of some of the things we heard. So fears and concerns. The staff I care about are leaving. I may have to move into a new home. Um, my mental health is impacted. And that I may move into a new home also means I may have to move back in with my family or whoever else for people we heard from who are living independently. Um, we've heard, unfortunately, people have said I uh, considered ending their life, which is tragic and scary and something we've talked about during COVID uh, update updates about people, you know, taking drastic measures or considering it. Um, you know, strangers are working with me. The turnover in staff is, has been huge. Um, there's been, we got a lot of comments about the maturity of caregivers, about the maturity of DSPs and how that seems to have faded over time. And also the impact of, uh, with the shorting, uh, the shortage of staff, we're just not able to fulfill all the promises of, of the ISP. So, people may not be able to get out as much as they used to. So uh, how do we support? We listen. That's uh, th that's across all the different areas, all the different people. Create crisis plans for those who are on the verge of crisis. That's something, again, the director mentioned they're working on. Improve on the job training to improve quality. Um, they, they really thought that getting to know a person and training in that way would, would help uh, improve the quality of the services, consolidate services and staff with others to meet my needs, and focus on the basics of caregiving. Any questions on this one? For the family, the fears and concerns of quality of staff has declined over the years. We've lost our provider completely. There, there's a few uh, um, folks that that were really struggling with that and uh, having to pursue their own routes to get any help they could get. A lot of talk about the mental health and the stress level is is heavily impacted. Um, a lot of talk about what happens when when I die to my loved one. Very concerned about that, which is again not new, and and they just didn't feel listened to uh, the families we talked to. A lot, of the, a lot of the comments we got in leaving um, was the families were so appreciative that someone was there to, to listen. Again, the support they need, um, come up with a plan to help the um, loved one manage and weather this crisis, um, support the families who have become providers, even they need a break. One mother said, I, I just want to take a walk. I, I, I just want to take a walk. She can't even take a walk because her, her son's needs are so in, intense. Um, we need you to trust us. We know what we need. Just listen and, and trust that uh, we will guide you in the right direction. And a lot of talk about wages and improving the wages to attract quality caregivers. Any questions or comments about family? Next for DSPs slash nurses, because we have huge nursing issues now that that are worsening. Um, fears and concerns, people working up uh, 70 hours or more a week. They, they miss their kids. I'm in crisis. I can make more somewhere else and have less responsibility. Uh, some say I should make at least $20 an hour, and this was for DSP comments. And there's a fear and concern of getting hurt because of fatigue and lack of support. Again, we need to listen to these issues, retain as many staff as we can to keep our system alive. So focus on who's staying, who's sticking with us and give them all they need. Uh, develop a comprehensive plan to address long and short team, a short term employee compensation um, and improve, improve the overall DSP compensation package. 
Uh, can we look at benefits? Can we look at child care, transportation, housing, uh, mentoring and support? Any questions or comments there? And the last area right now is for uh, providers, uh, fears and concerns. I, we get this question a lot and, and try to answer it. Does the system quote unquote get the severity of the crisis? It's hard to keep people safe with limited staff. Will our system survive this staffing crisis? We have lost our way when it comes to caring for people. Uh, paper over people came up a lot and the virus has created fatigue and we're losing we're losing leaders now. A lot of uh, uh, administrative staff are also leaving the field. Um, again, continue to listen. A fresh approach to oversight that the director already talked about. Um, or can we, is there flexibility? Uh, improve rates for DSPs and nurses and the infrastructure to support those DSPs, meaning uh, the supervision that is also needed to support those DSPs, the mentoring, and work on the overall updating of our system to make it easier to navigate while assisting uh, with the improvement of quality. Any questions, uh, comments about the provider piece? Pete, I don't think those last two slides advanced. There they go. Can you, what do you see now, Willie, the provider? You we see, see the, the first slide of the provider, yes. Okay. Do you see next steps? And then next steps, perfect. Um, so, um, what we have to do uh, is the next steps is learn from these visits and, and learn from our conversations that we have uh, with each other on this group. Um, we need to work on solution steps we can and, and will take. Um, the director already highlighted many things that we're working on, individual crisis plans. We addressed um, the need for more staff through the GED and 16, 17-year-olds, um, the technology solutions, um, the flexibility that the director mentioned around compliance reviews and how we can support uh, providers through those. There's many other things we're working on that we just have to keep chipping away as we said there's probably a thousand things we need to do and every one of them is important and i think we're we're getting there um uh, oacb is to share proactive steps with county boards to take on responding to the dsp shortage taking those lessons we learned uh, from our conversations and, and share them across the state uh, we're looking at scheduling possible follow-up visits um, we are going to visit uh, licking and perry friday just to touch base, uh, we are interested in, in maybe getting some video testimonials um, from some uh, people receiving services and their families, um, and we'll we'll see how that works out. Uh, we've said, you know, the reason we need these is we all need to partner together to help uh, advocate for what we need in our system, and this is an important step. And we had many families that were interested in that when we asked. Um, for that help uh, when we were there for visits. And um, evaluate the need for any new visits, meaning uh, are there any new counties that we need to visit? You know, as far as and as far as any new visits, um, from my perspective, I don't know if we'll really learn anything new necessarily, but I think we're at the point now if there are counties, and we've had a couple counties that reach out and ask for visits, and I I think it's we should probably focus more on any technical assistance or resources those folks need. I don't think the issues will be in uh, much much different than what we've already learned, but um, uh, we can continue to evaluate that. All right, so um, that's it for the presentation. I I do want to invite Willie and Steve and Stacy and Ann if they're on to to uh, talk more about the visits. I'm going to try to get out of this here. Go. go up to the folder, Willie, and there should be an X next to your leave. And if you click on that, it should stop sharing. Just call me Willie Kim. 
I did call you Willie. I'm looking at Willie in front of me and I'm talking to you. There you go. Don't don't insult me like that. I was going to say, I, I apologize to both you, Pete and Willie, for that. Believe it or not, it happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry For long previous trading days. So um, thanks, Pete, for that. So the one thing you held on the last step, one of the things that we have done through uh, the association uh, and what the county boards is we identified ways that the county board could help and we broke that up into categories and that was one for county board leadership and identified eight items for that. SSAs and county board staff we identified six items for that and then for provider support we identified five, five items and we have sent that out all to all the county boards as something for them to look at on ways that they could help support uh, the DSP crisis. So we have moved on that action item. For the uh, debrief visits, as, as Pete mentioned, um, we're probably going to keep that to just uh, trying to see what has happened in the last two months and see uh, any significant changes. And if the participants have any recommended ideas for one to two action steps that the county board can take as well as with the department to help if uh, in response to uh, their current changes. And the same thing with the videos, we just wanna see what kind of impact it's had. Uh, again, have people share their concerns and fears um, and if they have any pleas that they would like to make. So that's kind of the, the follow-up that we have planned for at least this week. And then we'll do some consideration for the rest of those visits. Hey, Pete and Willie, this is Debbie um, Jenkins. So I know that you said there's no plan to continue like to do more because you probably won't learn anymore. Um, and I kind of get that. I understand that everybody seems to be having the same issues, but it did appear that for individuals and families that just feeling listened to seemed to be very important and helpful to them. And so what can we take away from here? Is there another type of forum that we could create or maybe um, county boards can lead and several of us could participate in to kind of spread the load a little bit so that people can feel listened to and so that they can have some type of an opportunity to to share their their thoughts their concerns um, and just kind of provide some feedback into the system i think that's a, a great question debbie i i do think we need to do i when we say no more hotspot yeah. I think that format has run its course. I, I do think we have to continuously find ways to to listen to folks and and to to put our faces in front of them. And you know, I don't want to sound too dramatic, but see their tears. And in some of these visits, they were angry. You know, I mean, I thought I was going to get my butt kicked in in one county, but, uh, but and I get it, right? But at the end of that visit, it was really deeply appreciated and I I think I do think we have to come up with a plan for all of us to get out there and listen and, and hear, hear the concerns and hope hopefully continue to share ideas on how we're addressing the concerns and things they may not even know about um, like for example I think again these crisis plans that we're fresh in my head because we we're just involved in a meeting yesterday is an important step and and I think we got to get the word out about these things and share what what we're actually doing. We did get a couple calls from a couple counties to say, hey, what are you doing? When are you going to come back and tell us what you're doing about all this stuff? Um, and one of them we're visiting on Friday. So, um, you know, we, we just got to keep building that catalog of things we're working on. But long story short, I agree with you. I, I do think we have to find ways to continue to listen. And to follow up on that, Debbie, I, I think it's probably the best is just to do it locally at each county board is to have them sit down and just have those listen and learn visits, identify fears and concerns and say, what can we do and what's working and what's not working. That way it can action steps can happen immediately on the ground. If we, we break it up and make it any larger, then we just don't become very efficient. I think the urgency is so great that and we can do that. We can put some questions together and share those back with county board leadership to say these are the things that you can have those your own listen and learn sessions. Um, but I think the more we can respond immediately, the better it's going to be for those counties that are really hurting. Those in those families that are really hurting. You know, and I 
I, if I could say one more thing. Uh, if there's a theme for the last month, it's it's hope or lack thereof. Um, and and I think that I do think these visits gave people a little window of hope that there are people trying to work on this. And that was very important. Now we got to continue to open that window up, pry it open, continue to have difficult conversations, but the hope is is really the key and and that I do think these these interactions do do help with that. I think the other thing is that it has to be very clear that this is to listen and learn, share and collaborate. Um, in, in some locations, it's like, well, you're coming in, you're going to give us the solutions. And we said that very upfront. We don't have the solutions. We want to listen and learn from you. And then if we do local things, that it's not that the county board has all the solutions or the department has all the solutions, you know we can't have those immediate solutions. So it has to be that we're gonna work on this together. It's about that trust and that collaboration and the, the action steps that everybody can take to move forward. And the more we can do that, you know, at those each local levels is gonna help in the immediacy of it and then work on the bigger picture, which is part of what the task force is doing. So I think there was some situations where folks said, well, we'll just send us the solutions, tell us what to do. And if we had that, we would solve Ohio and then go on to Indiana and, you know, Kentucky and other states are having the same issues. I do, I would like if Steve or I don't know if Stacy or Anna are on Kim, but um, I can't really see, but Steve, if you have any feedback, that'd be great too. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I think you and Willie definitely captured, you know, what we heard at those visits um, and, and to kind of piggyback on what you said, the sitting in front of folks and, and hearing the stories really brought, you know, the, um, the severity of the situation um, to put a face to the to the problem, if you will. So that that portion of it was good, and I think you know the the idea of having these locally is a good idea as well. So that the all the you know one of the things that that you mentioned in the presentation that is true is is the relationship building and the collaboration that needs to happen in order for this to to some of these for some of these ideas to be successful. Um, you know, sitting in the same room and hearing those stories um could be the first stepping stone in some places where those relationships aren't the best right now so i think you know taking from your presentation what that that's what stood out to me was the idea of building those those relationships and some are there already and some uh, need to be enhanced but um you know those that's the piece of it that stuck out to me so i appreciate you bringing that up thanks steve any other questions or comments? Before we move on, Ken Kelly, um, I can read your first comment, but for some reason, your longer comment um, is just all whited out for me. So I can't, if, I don't know if you just want to say what you put in the chat or if it's sure. I, I can. So um, the Ohio Olmstead Task Force and some of the silks are. Um, sponsoring virtual forums in Toledo on Tuesday, October 26th, and Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Columbus on Thursday, October 28th from 3 to 4 p.m. to discuss the direct care workforce crisis. Um, each of the forums will include a panel of consumers, providers who will share their stories and answer any questions from those in attendance. Um, I'm going to, I've, I've offered to be one of the panelists here in Columbus. Um, well, they asked me and I said, okay. Um, and they are, we are inviting state representatives and the media from each region to attend in the ongoing effort to emphasize the potential dangerous situation we're in because of the lack of a direct care workforce, um, because, uh, that that's impacting people that are receiving home and community based services. But I think we also need to be realistic about the fact that it's impacting, um, our facility based, um, services as well. And, and um, you know, I think more than anything, this is just 
an ongoing effort of the OOTF to highlight what is really going on throughout Ohio. I mean, the word has to get out. I am amazed every single day that I'm um, talking to families. They reach out to me. They send me emails. They IM me in Facebook. They, and, But I, I'm just amazed at how little they really know about what's going on in Ohio. And somehow, I mean, we did a article uh, with Ken Gordon for the dispatch, which, um, boy, the information that I gave him was just not there. <laughs> I don't know. I think he was just trying to push it out, but um, he did a great job on highlighting the crisis for the aging population, but not very much about the DD or the uh, other Medicaid services that are, that are being, um, d that have deficiencies. And so I would like to see the media um, do a series on this if we can get them um, interested. So um, anybody that has any connections with the media, I know Pete, you they they quoted you in it as well. Um, but the I spoke with Ken for golly, four hours <laughs> on two and and on a separate occasion, there was another hour, and I sent him um, as much information as I could gather um, regarding this group and the OOTFs group and what was going on around Ohio. Um, and he wound up with this article that I just felt was subpar. I, I think we need to do a better job of marketing what's going on and, and not use the word marketing, but you, we, we have to let people know. I mean, that to me is where there's a huge deficiency is we know it, the county boards know it, the people living the life know it. But we have to get the rest of the world invested in this. I mean, I know a young man who had a job in Tennessee. He's from Ohio. He had a job in Tennessee. Um, and he he also had um, he was going to get his uh, he was going to college to finish his graduate work. OK, he had to give up that scholarship and he had to give up the job because he could not find a provider in Tennessee to to take care of him. And and so we're we're missing opportunity, I think, and we really, really need to get it out there. And I think Pete and Willie, I think and Steve, you guys are all doing a great job. Um, I love that presentation and I hope we get to have a copy of it. Kim, I <laughs> think, Kim, I think the reason why the media don't get the, a good testament to the system being overcomplicated because people think, why, why is it so, so you know, you tell them all this information and it overwhelms them. They can't get their arms around waivers. They can't get their arms around certification. They can't, it's just so much right. that the media can't find a talking point. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah, it does. And and um, that is some of the things, some of the feedback that I get from providers is there the administrative piece to, to being an independent um, is just so intense that um, a lot of them are just thrown in the towel. And and like you, you mentioned today, Pete, there is a nursing crisis and it's getting worse. Um, I, I use both um, HPC and nursing, so I can attest to that. Um, and, and I really feel like um, a lot of it is just confusion, um, inability and, and inability to, to become an independent provider easily it's the you know it, it's months some of them are waiting months to get um certified and it's because the background checks are being stalled and it's because um they they can't understand the questions that are being asked or what information they need to provide and and we all know that when you apply to be a dog provider that it asks you for a medicaid number or an mpi number or something it's kind of like putting the cart before the horse and people are confused and they don't know what to do and we tell them to call the hotline and they call the hotline and they say well they didn't really answer my question and so they're going out on facebook and they're 
they're asking other providers, what did you put in that, you know, field? How, how do I, I mean, I don't know if we do a video or, or what to help people become independent providers, but, um, I think that's part of what we have to start recruiting. And then as far as agency providers, I don't know. I don't know how you get more people to come in. It's a calling. Being a provider is a calling. And if you are not, if, if you don't have it in your heart and your mind to serve another human being, um, then we don't want you. We really don't want you. You can't go from being a waitress to going in and providing someone with total care or going in and providing someone who has severe behaviors with the direction and the help that they truly need. Um, it, it just doesn't work like that. And so we have to promote the field. We have, I mean, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but this is just the things that I hear. And it, it, it's sad because after 28 years of doing this, I've never seen it this bad. I, I, I got two things to say. First, when we talk to the media, when we talk to the media, we talk to the public, we need to keep it simple. Right. We, we can't go into all the detail because it's so competing to that. This say there's not enough people who want to do the work, don't go into labor, don't go into all that. Because people don't get that. They really don't get that. The second thing I want to say is that when it comes to finding people to do care, I think you find the mission by actually meeting individuals. We don't let them meet the individual before we put them to work. They need to create a relationship with individual first before you put them. I'm not kidding you. People that have done my care have done it because they know me first. And that works so much better than putting people in some place. And they don't know what the heck to do. They don't know how to communicate with the individual. And it's really isolating. She needs to not know what to do with this individual. So we're kind of doing it. We're kind of doing it backwards now. We need to create the force by, by bringing people in and meeting other people before we put them to work. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, that totally made sense. All right, I'm going to move us on because I'm watching the clock. And Kim, can I ask you, you can just email me and then I'll make sure it gets put in the notes. If you have the locations or any more detail on those meetings, I'll make sure it gets in our notes in case anyone wants to attend or... Um, um, actually, we're going to have a meeting about it on Thursday, so I'll have more information then. Okay. Um, the specifics and how and, and possibly links to the webinars. All right. If you forward those my way, we'll make sure it gets distributed. I sure will. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you guys for that conversation. And thank you, Pete and Willie, for putting the presentation together. And we'll again also make sure that gets posted for everyone. Um, all right, Steve, you were going to walk us quickly through an update on our proposal status. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Uh, I'm going to pull up a document. We'll make sure this gets distributed with the notes as well. But this is just a quick look at um, all the proposals that have been um, submitted up until this point and kind of where they are in the process. And we put a column on here that shows um, basically what DODD involvement is in each one of these proposals. 
Um, so again, we'll, we'll make sure everybody gets to look at this um, and offer any comments or suggestions to it, but it's really just a point in time look at where things are. Um, because we only have a couple of minutes, I'll just do a couple of highlights. Uh, one was, um, I believe it was the last meeting, the critical in demand job proposal from, from Willie that was voted to be implemented. We did send a letter over to the governor's Office of Workforce Transformation. We do have a meeting set up with them to discuss that. So um, that is moving along. Um, try and pick out a couple of the highlights here. Um, the appreciate the folks from OSU and I saw Christine's comment that we have some students on the line today as well. Um, so the expanding the longevity and complex care add-ons. Uh, I know Nate brought that to the table and from again, this is from our perspective, you know, OSU students um, are kind of conducting research and provide a, a final report on that. So we have a representative on that group as well. And on the second page, I think the director did a great job, obviously in the opening talking about technology. So that proposal is moving along in an active status. Um, the DSP compensation, I know that was a joint proposal from a, um, a few different groups. And, uh, you know, as far as the next steps on that one, you know, in this group, we've talked about the ODDP, the AAI work uh, that will be done through an RFP process. So uh, we will definitely keep the task force updated on on the progress of that. And when that RFP goes out uh, for those rate setting work. Uh, the shared living proposal again i think that was last week or i'm sorry the the previous meetings uh we are just now convening the subcommittee um to start working on that and the um how to more effectively communicate about the shared living service options we'll make sure to bring those uh, recommendations back to the task force as well um, so again i know i blew through some of those pretty quickly um, but if anybody has any questions or additions um, obviously, we can discuss it now or again, these will be sent out with the notes and you can offer feedback at, at that point in time as well. So, Jackie, I don't know if you needed anything else from from this perspective. I have a question. This is Teresa. Uh, Steve, I just I don't off the top of my head remember the rebuilding the behavior support infrastructure one, I, I but I feel like it had something to do with the rate or the add on which was not actually part of the behavior support rule work group. So do you remember that one off the top of your head? Off the top of my head, the way I remember it, and I can go back and reread it and put some more detail in here if it's needed. I remember it as in, and Pete, I think this was one of your proposals, so please correct me if, if I'm wrong in any of this. Um, it was more around what are the support structures around um, building behavior, you know, positive behavior support plans and those type of things. I don't remember it specifically being around the, the add on, but I could be wrong in that. I'm definitely willing to go back and look at that again. Yeah, Teresa, I, I think I think you're right. And, and from our perspective, it was we were getting feedback that there seemed to be a deterioration of of local behavior support, infrastructure support for providers. Um, and we we want to take a fresh look at what what is actually going on out there. Is is it deteriorating or is it um, where is the support coming from? You know, so on and so forth. It was all around people who who are um, experiencing some very challenging behaviors and providers struggling to support them effectively. Um, we didn't feel like we had the infrastructure to be able to do that. So that's that was from my perspective. That's part of the conversation. And I see Willie has his hand up. I mean, I have the proposal in front of me. It was about conducting a study around how many counties are offering provider support in the areas that Pete just talked about. Um, so we can revisit that again. Steve was just putting a quick chart for status. So if we've accidentally left something behind that needs to be picked up, we can absolutely do that. Willie, did you still want to jump in? I think you had your hand up. Yeah, so um, appreciate the, the grid, Steve. That's very helpful. Uh, and we have had some discussion was outside of the task force about uh, an idea of ways to build capacity. It's like almost a behavior support specialist academy. Um, 
So that, that's something that can be part of that discussion. Um, but before we close, I just wanted to, to add, uh, share that um, for the crisis planning that OACB would like to, to be a resource and support to that and help with that. So that would be Lisa Combs and myself. So uh, somebody can just connect us at the department who's gonna be leading that so we can work with them around that crisis planning piece. Okay. All right, um, our time is, these one hour meetings always go really fast. Our time is at a close. Um, I wanna thank everyone and again, thank Willie and uh, Pete and Steve for um, compiling so much information for us today and everyone else for participating and providing insights. Um, Jeff or Kim, do I wanna throw it back to either of you for any closing comments? Other than to thank Pete and Willie and S Steve and Stacy and everyone for the visits and everyone tolerating us as we were out and everyone on the phone, thank you. All right, we are next set to meet on October 27th. That will be a two hour meeting starting at one o'clock on Teams. So thank you guys. We'll be sure and get notes out. We appreciate everyone um, helping make sure our notes are accurate. And we'll also make sure any of the presentations or materials are posted so that you have access to them. So thank you guys very much for everything and we'll be back together again in two weeks.